This video is for any sort of spiritualist, whether you are a witch, a ceremonial magician, an occultist, a chaos magician, a heathen, a psychic, or maybe a more new age spiritual being. Whatever you identify as in these spiritual communities, this video is for you. We're going to be talking about how to think critically, VPG versus UPG. We're going to talk about sources, how to figure out what is credible and what is not credible. There are going to be so many different tips and tricks in this video to figure out the best way to incorporate information information into your spiritual practice. I would like to start this conversation out by discussing how there is a bit of a problem in our community, in the occult and spiritual communities. Being able to think critically is really, really difficult in spiritual spaces, and I want to kind of go over some of the reasonings, at least the reasons why I believe this to be true. The first reason is subjectivity. Spirituality is so subjective and personal to one's own experience. Your belief, your personal experience, your faith, these are things that can't really be tested empirically. Another reason why critical thinking is difficult in these spaces is because of emotional attachment. People often have really strong emotional attachments to what they believe on a spiritual and energetic level, and it can be really difficult to remain objective and to even feel comfortable questioning your own beliefs. It's really difficult when you are so emotionally tied to something that is deeply important to you. And really with all types of spirituality, there is just a lack of empirical evidence. A lot of the concepts that we talk about cannot really really be thoroughly examined through either scientific or rational methods, and so this can deter critical thinking. There's also this ambiguity and a little bit of a mystery element when we're talking about spirituality, and sometimes we put our faith in things unknown because it makes our faith stronger. We cannot prove it, we just need to believe in it. And then there is also groupthink and confirmation bias. When we have multiple people saying the same things or believing the same things, they can convince others to think the way that they are thinking is fact. Confirmation bias can be really, really strong and, and you might eventually find yourself in an echo chamber where everybody thinks and feels the exact same way as you do, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's fact. And then things can get sticky and tricky because of historical context or cultural context. Traditions can carry centuries of heritage and tradition, families passing down a tradition to each new generation, and so it makes it really difficult to challenge or critique those beliefs and practices because it's part of someone's culture. And of a similar mindset, there is this personal significance that spirituality can hold for some individuals. Spiritual beliefs can be so personal that trying to challenge someone else's beliefs can really feel like an attack on them, on their culture, on their heritage, on their own personal beliefs. So it gets really tricky to kind of navigate this world of critical thinking and vetting sources and challenging beliefs. And then there is also, of course, just a, a lack of resources, a lack of education. People don't know how to find a credible source or even when they do, maybe the sources aren't available. Not everyone has the same tools and resources for being able to read books and books and find all these papers and talk to all these different practitioners. Not everyone is lucky enough to do that. So that kind of sums up the, the problem in our occult spaces sometimes is that it can be really difficult to think critically and to have conversations around this subject. So let's begin clarifying the problem a little bit further and also hopefully by the end of this video I will have provided you some solutions for how to think critically and navigate this whole messy world of spirituality, especially if you're a beginner, it can be really daunting. This video is actually part of a massive collaboration. There are quite a few content creators that are doing Thinktober, that's what the hashtag is called, and we're all kind of tackling this topic from different angles. So I'm not quite sure at this time who is going to do this collaboration with me. There's a group of us that are going to do it, and I'm not actually sure who's filming and who's not. So I will link the creators that are doing this challenge down in the description box below, and also if you click click on the hashtag of this title, the Thinktober, or if you type in hashtag Thinktober into the YouTube search box, all of the videos will pop up from every creator that is currently tackling this topic. The first thing that we need to discuss is VPG versus UPG. This is something that I'm going to refer to a lot throughout the rest of the video, so I want to get a couple definitions out of the way, just in case if you may not be familiar with what that is. So VPG is Verified Personal Gnosis. This refers to spiritual beliefs, spiritual experiences or insights that seem to be validated by the spiritual community. So these spiritual beliefs can align with maybe a specific tradition, 
religion, a specific school of thought, a specific practice or belief system from a particular region, and verified personal gnosis tends to be or is seen to be a little bit more reliable. I think authoritative might be a better word to describe that, but I wanted to give some examples of verified personal gnosis as well. So in the witchcraft community, we often use the moon phases as a symbolic element in our spell work or whatever we're trying to manifest. And the moon phases, the new moon being new beginnings, the bud of creation, the full moon being the climax, the pinnacle of success. We have all these correlations to different parts of the moon phase. That would be verified personal gnosis because there is a symbolic element with the moon phases that all of us can kind of come to a general consensus about. Obviously, your personal experience may be totally different, but there is a general understanding within the witchcraft community what moon phase correlates to what type of symbolism. You may see this with herbal associations as well, so certain plant spirits or herbs or whatever that are thrown into spell work will have specific meanings tied to them. And the verified personal gnosis is this collective idea of how this plant spirit typically operates. So rosemary, for example, a lot of people use rosemary for protection. It is a great herb to use in protection workings of all kind. That is a sort of verified personal gnosis because many, many people have used rosemary in this way and can concur that rosemary is an excellent herb to use for protection. Same thing goes with sabbats and rituals of all kind. You know, if you have Samhain versus Beltane, which are two pagan festivals, we have certain correlations with each one of those, right? Different festivals, different holidays have specific correlations to them, and that is all verified personal gnosis because we all share this similar idea to how to celebrate a particular holiday. Now let's talk about UPG. So UPG is unverified personal gnosis. So we had verified personal gnosis, and now we're going to talk about unverified personal gnosis. So unverified personal gnosis is an experience that is very unique to the individual. It can be very powerful to the individual experiencing this, but UPG is generally considered a little less reliable than VPG, than verified personal gnosis, because it is this one particular individual's experience. It is not necessarily shared by the collective of that community. So an example of UPG is when you're working with deities, particular gods and goddesses. You may have one person have a very unique experience when they're working with one particular god that is maybe not necessarily shared by the community or the group. I think symbolism is another great example of UPG because let's say you have a raven land on your front porch or right outside your windowsill. That can be a sign, right? Signs and symbolism are something that we talk about a lot in the spiritual communities and signs in general are so personal. Personal to the individual's previous experiences or correlations in their own subconscious mind. If I have a raven land on my front doorstep or right outside my windowsill, that can mean something completely different to me than it does to another person just based on our own personal experiences and our own correlations with the raven, for example. And so unverified personal gnosis would be me looking at that raven and realizing maybe it's a message from my grandmother because that raven holds a lot of significance to the relationship I had with my grandmother and maybe her favorite bird was a raven and that's how she wants to send me messages from beyond whenever she has something to say. And this is also as a side note about signs and symbolism, this is why it's so hard to give advice to other people when they're asking, is this a sign of something? No one can tell you that it's a sign or not a sign and it is a hundred percent up to you to figure that out for yourself because it's all based on UPG. It's based on your own perceptions of the situation. Now UPG, or unverified personal gnosis, can get a lot of hate sometimes. It really can because some people say they don't want to hear your unverified personal gnosis. They only want verified or facts. But I actually think a lot of the goodness in our communities comes from UPG. It always starts with one person's experience of saying, hey, this happened to me and it was really meaningful. Did this also happen to you? And sometimes unverified personal gnosis becomes verified personal gnosis when it seems like the entire community is experiencing the exact same thing. I also really like listening to other people's UPG because it gives me insight not only to how their brain works, but how to really analyze my own mind and to see if that's something that I resonate with or something I don't resonate with. So I love UPG. I love listening to other people's perspectives and experiences. The only problem with our spiritual communities when it comes to VPG and UPG is when people try to pass off their unverified personal gnosis as verified personal gnosis or even fact. You will see this in books even, in books about spirituality. You will see this on blogs all over. You go on 
Reddit, you talk to people in the comments, you go on Facebook groups, you go through the comments there. There are so many people trying to pass off their own unverified gnosis as either fact or something that is verified. And so that is where you really want to start thinking critically. Anytime that you are presented with a new piece of information, the first step to thinking critically is to assess is this unverified personal gnosis or is this verified? And even if it is verified, question that as well. Does this new piece of information resonate with you? Because in my personal opinion, and I know this is very controversial to say, I don't think that there are any official spiritual leaders. I mean, sure, there are some people in our communities where we could point to them and say, yeah, you're a leader or you're good at leading or whatever, but I don't personally think there are any official leaders. I think there are some people that can guide us and and maybe give us inspiration. But when it comes to spirituality, for me, I don't necessarily put anyone up on a pedestal as an official leader. I think we're all just stumbling around and trying to figure it out together. And I know in some spaces that it gets a little tricky because if you have a coven or if you're part of a church or, you know, there's always some leaders in that particular group or that particular practice, that's not necessarily what I'm talking about. I'm just saying in general, in the spiritual communities, I don't see one particular leader that can come up to tell me, what is right and what is wrong. So even if something is verified personal gnosis, that is something that you can question and see if it resonates for you. So yes, UPG can be very, very powerful. So can VPG. But again, the first step to thinking critically is to really assess which one it is and see how it resonates. There is a question that I get quite a lot in the comments of my videos, and the question is, how do you figure out whether a source is credible or not? How do you vet your sources? Because again, as I said in the beginning of this video, there is a lack of empirical evidence because it's so subjective. Spirituality is so subjective. So how can you even find good sources? And I think this is something so important for us to talk about. So I'm gonna give you a bunch of tips here for how I personally like to vet my sources. Again, please don't look at me like I'm an authority figure. I want you to question everyone, including me. Take the information that I'm saying and cross-reference it elsewhere and figure out what resonates and what doesn't, but you should never take all the words as fact. You definitely have to do the research yourself and figure out how you feel about it. So the first thing that I look at when I'm picking out a new book to read, let's say in the witchcraft community or occultism or whatever it is, or not even a book, let's say a workshop, or if I'm reading a blog post, or if I'm watching a YouTube channel, I look at the biography of that author, that content creator, that writer, you know, whatever it is, I am looking at their biography to assess their expertise. So I think it's really important to understand where that that person is coming from as far as their background goes because if they have a background as a Wiccan or a Buddhist or a Christian or whatever their background says that is going to influence the information that they're presenting to you and so I will sit down to read a book let's say let's take Wicca for example because I personally have never been Wiccan but I do have a lot of books I own a lot of books back here that have been written by Wiccan authors and if I know that that person is Wiccan then I can say okay this book is going to have a Wiccan flair to it. It doesn't mean that that book isn't worth reading by any means. It just means that there may be some components in there that I don't necessarily relate to and that's absolutely okay. But you want to see if they've gone through any sort of formal training and then if they have gone through formal training, look at that formal training and see how credible that is. If somebody says they went to some random Harry Potter school, that's great, but okay, what does that Harry Potter school have to actually say for themselves? What are they teaching their students. So it's not just enough to read someone's biography and see all the credentials they have, but also check the places where they got their credentials from, especially in the spiritual community, because we have no government regulations on these types of programs. So some programs definitely are a little bit more credible than others, according to the community. Some are going to have a lot more of a rigorous study than other programs. You also might want to look to different teachers and mentors in the community that are highly respected in in whatever community you're a part of, if you are Wiccan or if you're into witchcraft or if you're into ceremonial magic, you're into more new age spirituality, looking at who people consider the teachers and the mentors and who they are affiliated with. I think that's so important is to look at who people are affiliated with. 
but really you're just trying to assess the expertise of the person talking to you and figure out do they know their shit or don't they and for some practices that are more rooted in culture and heritage and lineage and all those types of things you really want to look at the person that's teaching you to try to figure out their relationship with that culture or that heritage lineage etc do they have a deep connection to this well-established tradition are they respected in the community essentially have they done the work and in more academic or scholarly studies of the occult, of spirituality, etc., peer-reviewed publications and journals are typically considered credible sources. So these are sources that have been reviewed by experts in the field that have degrees from universities that have been studying this for a really long time. If something is a little bit more historic, if they are trying to provide evidence by showing some sort of historical context, you want to check that person's sources as well. So whether it's on a blog post, again, a YouTube video, a book, whatever it is, you'd think that all the information in a book is true and valid, but that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes people publish books with a lot of misinformation in it. They claim that things have happened in the past when they didn't even happen in the past. And it seems that if someone starts a sentence of, in 1872, blah, 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 we assume that it's true, right? We assume that in 1872, this thing actually happened. But it's important to cross-reference that information somewhere else to make sure that what the author is writing is true, which is so incredibly frustrating as a reader because when you buy a book you want all the information in there to be accurate or true but I have definitely found books in the occult community where there were historical inaccuracies and when I did cross-reference that and look elsewhere I found out that either that situation didn't happen at all or it was skewed with a personal bias or it wasn't happening during the time frame that they claimed it did. So if a book has sources, if they have, you know, a little footnotes area and they've got all the sources cited below for everything that they're talking about, or maybe they have sources towards the end of the book, that's a great sign. Look into those sources that they cited and see if what they're saying is actually true. And also what are those sources? Are those sources <laughs> credible or not? I would advise you to be very cautious if sources rely heavily on anecdotal or unverified evidence. I think consistency and reliability is another really big thing when it comes to vetting sources. If you look up an author, you can see all the other books that they've written and see if they are consistent in their teachings, if they have a lot of books about one particular subject. There was actually a recent situation that came up. I'm running a book club with my channel members right now, and when it came time to choose the book for our book club, it was really frustrating for us because we ended up finding out that one of the books that was suggested by someone happened to be a book that was generated by AI. And there's such a huge problem in the spiritual communities right now where a lot of the books being sold are AI generated. So that's why it's so important to look at the author first and see if this is someone that you want to learn information from. One of the ways that we were able to figure out whether this book is AI generated or not is because you could find no information on the author at all, anywhere. The bio was very, very vague. It was only about a paragraph long and it was very vague, had nothing to do with the author whatsoever. And there was no social media following, they had no Instagram, no Facebook, no nothing, and that's fine. Authors don't necessarily have to have that, but we also couldn't find any other information anywhere about this author. There was no information about them as to who they were. And yes, there are some authors in the spiritual community that really try to hide their identity for fear of persecution, especially in the witchcraft community. That's a really big thing. But even so, they'll take a fake name and that's fine, but they'll at least have some sort of biography as to where they got their training, what sort of credentials they have as a witchcraft practitioner. And then upon further research, what we found about this author, the so-called author, is that they had published numerous books just in the last couple years alone on subjects all over the place. Usually you'll have an author that specializes kind of in a subsection, a, a sub area of spirituality. When you have someone who's publishing books in all traditions of spirituality all over the place that span across multiple different cultures and lineages and practices since the dawn of time, it seems very odd for someone to have that broad of an expertise on all these different subjects. And if they do, which is very, very possible that they do, they will have a biography that shows their training, their education, their background, how they got all of this information in the first place. When there is an author just putting out a ton of books on a bunch of different subjects, 
that is absolutely a red flag because if they're not sharing how they got that information in the first place, it's probably misinformation or it's watered down or it's AI generated. Mari Silva, I am calling you out right now because Google says that you have written 18 books in the past three years. You are either an incredibly fast writer or you are not a real person. We cannot find any biography for you. And the span of these books, I mean, we have things all the way from telekinesis to astral projection to astrology to the African Orishas to Norse paganism to the pineal gland covering hoodoo and voodoo and psychic abilities all the way over to Santeria to Celtic spirituality to shadow work and even a book on Enochian magic, which seems very, very unlikely. So Mari Silva, if you are a real person, please let me know and I applaud you for being able to cover that many subjects. I will edit this part out if you ever confirm that you are real or not. So the whole AI book situation right now, it is so beyond frustrating and we need to be critically thinking more than ever. So consistency and reliability is really important. Looking at that author's past work, trying to see their track record in the community and things like that. I think transparency is another way to really vet a credible source or not because you can have a great source that has a ton of UPG in it, a ton of unverified personal gnosis and have that source be really helpful to your magical practice. As long as that author is being transparent. As long as the author is actually saying, hey, this is my own UPG. This is not verified personal gnosis. This is unverified personal gnosis. And if that's the case and they have that level of transparency, fantastic. You can still use that information in your magical practice if it resonates with you. But the lack of transparency, that is a problem. Again, where they're trying to pass off this unverified personal gnosis as fact. Another way to vet a source is to kind of check the tone of that author or content creator, etc. Credible sources often often encourage you to take what resonates and leave the rest. They tell you to question everything, to challenge everything. They present this information to you and you can take it or leave it. If that author or content creator or a blog writer or whatever, if they're pushing something to you and they're demanding your blind faith in that subject, that is a red flag. Unquestioning acceptance is not okay in my opinion. And again, just to kind of reiterate what I've already said, there isn't really any government regulations on trainings, on, you you know, people can write a book and publish whatever they want, especially when it comes to self-publishing or independent publishing. People can write whatever they want in books. And I think some people have the idea that if you pick up a book, whatever is in that book is fact and that's not necessarily true. You can also look at the publishers as well. There's publishing houses that are really respected in the community. And so if an author is working with that particular publisher, you might be able to see that book as a little bit more credible than somebody who's maybe potentially working with someone else. Again, and you still want to like fact check though and you still want to look into the author's bio and all of that stuff. So I hope that helps you analyze some of these sources a little bit better and figure out which ones are credible to you and which ones are not. Now let's move on to some other tips for how to think critically in spiritual spaces. The first one that comes to my mind is questioning beliefs and not just questioning the beliefs of other people, but really questioning your own beliefs. If you're trying to be as objective as possible, really being able to question your own beliefs is healthy. Ask yourself why you believe certain things to be true and do you have any sort of evidence that supports this? Is that evidence a little bit more subjective or can it be objective on any level? And I think it's healthy for us to consistently challenge our own beliefs. I think it's healthy to constantly challenge and assess my ego, check my ego a little bit and ask myself why I believe certain things to be true. Because oftentimes my beliefs will change over time. They will change over the years as I grow and learn and evolve. Another tip I have for thinking critically is to, again, research and verify everything. We kind of already discussed this when figuring out what a credible source is and isn't, but you really want to cross reference everything that people say. If you read something in an article, do a little bit of research to see if someone else is saying the same things. Does it come off with the same tone or do these people have personal biases when they're writing this information? If someone says something in the spiritual community to you on a Facebook post, in a Facebook group, or on Reddit, or some other social media platform, if they say something to you that sounds like fact, question them on that a little bit. And it doesn't have to be rude, it doesn't have to instigate a fight or whatever, but I think it's important for us to have discussions so that we can better understand someone else's else's perspective. So if somebody is stating something as fact, ask them where this information comes from and see what sort of evidence they can provide to back up their claim. 
And if they don't have evidence to back up their claim, maybe it is more based on personal gnosis, and that's just as valid, that's fine, personal gnosis is great. But you definitely wanna know if that information is personal gnosis versus them trying to pass it off as some sort of fact when it's not. Another thing I would advise people of is to be cautious of pseudoscience. I, I am a science lover, don't get me wrong, people that have been on my channel for a while, you know how much I love science, I love the psychology of things. Sometimes people try to use scientific jargon to pass something off as scientific and like it's a proven fact or that it's a proven law or something when really it's not. So definitely be on the lookout for pseudoscience. I love reading new research on different things, things that could potentially bridge the gap between science and spirituality. I am all over that and I am so open-minded to new studies. But when someone presents a study to you or they say that uh, this has been proven or whatever, definitely do your own research on that study and see what the study actually was. The the interpretation of different studies can really be persuasive. You can have two people looking at the exact same scientific study and they can take away different things from it based on the results. And so if you have personal bias thrown in there, somebody can look at that personal study and then throw in their personal bias about the results that came out of that and make some sort of claim about it that may or may not necessarily be true. So I think looking into pseudoscience a little bit more and just being wary of that, I think is really, really important. I also think it's important to remain open-minded. I don't want people to become so critical to the point where they are closed off to anything new that presents themselves. That is not the point of this video. The point of this video is to help people think critically, not to become closed-minded. Closed-mindedness and critical thinking, they are not synonymous. You do not have to be a closed-minded person in order to be a critical thinker. In fact, I encourage you, I've said this many times on my channel, but a true scientist is open to the idea that they are wrong. I would argue argue that many of us are wrong. In fact, I would argue that all of us are wrong because we are all stumbling around and figuring this out together. I think it's so important to remain open-minded to new possibilities that are presented to you. So even though critical thinking does involve a level of skepticism, I think it's so important to still remain open to new ideas, new beliefs, new insights, etc. Another thing that I want to talk about is discernment, especially when it comes to exploitation in witchcraft spaces, in occult spaces, this new age spirituality, whatever it is. Be very cautious of individuals who make grandiose claims. So if people are making these unrealistic claims such as take my course or my seminar and I promise I will change your life within three days. You know, you've ever, have you ever heard those claims before where they promise to radically change your life within a very short period of time and all you need to do is pay for their course, their book, their seminar, whatever it is. I think it's really important to pay attention to exploitation, especially in spiritual circles, because you have people that are trying to pass themselves off as spiritual leaders when really they're just trying to take your money and run or to feed you some bullshit and have you fall into it and put them up on a pedestal as some sort of God. There are many people in the spiritual community that have tried to do that over the past few centuries at least. So be very weary of people that are false idols, false gods, people that are trying to sell you stuff. There is absolutely nothing wrong with a spiritual person trying to make that their livelihood. An author writing a book and then selling it for money so that they can continue to write and to be reimbursed for their time and their effort. I think it's the same for content creators. I think that people deserve to get paid for their time and their energy, period. But when you are considering these grandiose claims where someone says, I'm going to going to sell you something and it's going to absolutely change your life, I promise. Those words, I promise, or it will happen, those definitive statements with these grandiose claims, that can potentially be a red flag. And you get this with covens as well in the witchcraft community where people will claim that they are a high priestess, and it's actually kind of insulting to other people who are high priestesses, who have gone through lots and lots of training and who are excellent at what they do, but you have these uh, people that are wanting to be some sort of false idol or false god. Well, to them, it's not false. They are God. But they want to be this, this person sitting up high, having all of these disciples down below them, worshiping them. And that is something that is really, really important to use your critical thinking skills, your discernment, just so you don't fall prey into situations like that. Another tip, I would avoid blindly following any one particular tradition or practice. And the key word here is blindly following because it's absolutely okay to just stick with one tradition or practice but really when you're blindly following something, you're not questioning anything,
listening, you're not using critical thinking skills to really determine if this is something that even resonates with you in the first place. In the witchcraft community, especially, the, the witchcraft community is so diverse. There's so many different paths that one can take. And critical thinking really allows you to try out those different paths, to experiment, and to really fine tune what it is that works for you specifically. I encourage you to experiment with lots and lots of different things, lots of traditions, lots of beliefs, lots of techniques, and that way you can really find something that deeply resonates. Another tip that uh, I have basically said throughout this entire video is to question authority. You definitely want to question authority, question leadership. If someone tells you something, don't immediately take it as fact. Really look into that person and see, do I value this person as a mentor or a teacher? But the important part is to question these people, including me. Question me, don't take everything I say as fact. You need to evaluate their expertise, the information that they're giving you, et cetera, et cetera. And the last tip that I really wanted to say here for critical thinking is, I think having a practice of self-reflection is really, really important. Just having a regular practice of journaling to assess your progress on your spiritual journey, writing down the things that you're reading, the things that you're learning, the things that inspire you, what does your spiritual practice look like, what do your beliefs look like, and then really question that and say, does this actually resonate with me or is this something that I'm doing because somebody else told me to do it? For example, I think shadow work in the witchcraft community is a really big one right now where everyone's encouraging you to do shadow work. Do your shadow work, everyone says. Some people preach that we should be doing shadow work and they don't even understand what shadow work actually even is. In my personal opinion, people can do whatever the hell they want. People can do shadow work or don't do shadow work. It's not something that's like a requirement for your spiritual practice. Now I will say, Shadow work for me has been immensely helpful in my practice and I would highly recommend it to everybody. Do people need to do it? No. Would I recommend it to people? Absolutely, because it helps you get to know yourself a little bit better. And there's so much that goes into shadow work that can just be so instrumental for introspection and so many other things. So yes, I think shadow work is important, but I, I, but I hear a lot of people sitting down attempting to do shadow work and it's not even something that they wanna do and they're like, do I even have to do this? So really sitting down and assessing are you doing these things because you want to and because it resonates with you or are you doing these things because other people told you that that's what you have to do because you don't have to do anything this is your own spiritual practice and you get to make your own decisions yes just to reiterate I do think shadow work is important but all I'm trying to say is that there are no hard rules there are no regulations you get to assess what works for you and what doesn't and that is all I had for you on the topic of critical thinking today if there is anything that I missed please feel free to comment it in the comments box below. I'd love to get a little thread going of different ways that people can practice critical thinking. I think that's going to be so, so important for our community. So please feel free to put your opinions in the comment box below. And again, don't forget to check out the other creators that are doing this Thinktober hashtag because they are, I'm actually not sure quite what other people are doing. I've heard their ideas, but I'm not 100% sure. So I'll be watching those videos as well. I'm really excited to see them, but I'm really happy that a lot of us in the, the witchcraft community specifically are really tackling this Thinktober project and really trying to tackle this subject from all different angles. So definitely go check out those other videos. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you all in another video soon.